Hello. Sorry I didn't make it in the morning. Um, I think I need some biohacking technology to wake up on time. So this thing that I have on my face right now is synchronizing my circadian rhythm because all of the travel that I've been doing. Uh, so the blue wavelengths of light that dominate in the morning when the sun goes up, it triggers our body, the supranucleus um, membrane in your brain uh, to synchronize your biological clock. In the evening, when you go to sleep, the red light, red wavelengths, near infrared, dominate. And they trigger in our biology the processes that are related to recovery. And that's what I'm shining into my brain right now. So this light here is a laser, and it has a pretty interesting effect I'm going to tell you a little bit about. So my name is Teemu Arena, and I'm a serial technology entrepreneur. I founded my first company when I was 16. I'm 36 now. And uh, I was selected as the speaker of the year uh, last year in Finland. I'm also a biohacker. Biohacking is the art and science of optimizing your body, mind, and biology with technological and biological tools. It's all about gaining deep insight into your human physiology, the understanding that you are already technology, that your biology, when you go deep into your DNA, when you go in there, you realize that information is primary, information that replicates forward as your cells divide and as you pass those genes on to your offspring. So when you go deeper to understanding the fact that we are already technology, we're already leveraging that biological potential, you can start to see technology and the scientific discoveries that we have done as extensions of man, that you can, with those tools and technologies that we are developing, you can take the human species to the next level. I wrote a book called The Biker's Handbook. It takes a systemic view into the different aspects of what it means to be human. And we basically look at the human body as a computer. And when we are looking at things like sleep, what I'm interested in is what's going on in terms of electric activity in the brain. How does the body temperature drop? Uh, what are the changes in heart rate? And what are all the things that contribute to a really nice high quality, good night's sleep. When we look at exercise, I'm interested in the Krebs cycle, that in your mitochondria, in every single cell, there's this energy center that produces energy called ATP. And when you exercise, you do things like, how do you leverage your body to produce that energy, etc. So for me, this is already a pretty intricate computer. And with technology, I can measure and understand better how it functions. And I can also use technology to take it to a new level. So a little bit more about the tech that I'm wearing right now. So this light here is actually a medical device. It's used clinically to manage pain. And it, uh, this specific wavelength of light in this laser also makes wounds heal uh, twice as fast. And, and the mechanisms are basically that every single cell in your body that has mitochondria in it, when you shine this light into it, it triggers the release of ATP, which is energy. Uh, it activates something called cytochrome C oxidase. But anyway, so clinically it's used for pain management. But what I'm using it for is like a cup of coffee. So it's like laser cocaine, basically. So it, it really uh, lights up your brain. And they did studies on mice where they would shine this light into one part of the body. And they would know this wounds healing faster on the other side of the body. So there are systemic effects through the bloodstream that we don't fully understand yet. And there is a lot of blood flow in the back of the brain. And in 20 minutes' time, every single cell in my body gets exposed to the effects that are coming from this device, specifically. So this is just an example of biohacking. So to me, men and machines 
can unite, they can work together. We often think of technology as separate of humans, but I think that technology is intricately, inherently human. I believe that technology is a very human affair. If you think of technology as a definition, it's a leverage. It helps us to leverage and do things that we can't otherwise. So things like tools are leverages for us to do things that we can't otherwise as humans. And nowadays we have computers, we have hammers, we have fire, we have wheels. Now, technology doesn't do anything without us. So we, as humans, we give technology its purpose. And when we think of tools and technologies, they're not really separate from us, but they're part of us. If you think of a man who is driving a bicycle, it's one system that moves. It's, they are not separate. So by choosing what kind of tools and technologies you can use, obviously every one of you know, you can take your work and productivity and life to a new level. So to me, transcending what it means to be human is the unification with our tools and technologies. Now they might be slightly separate from our bodies, like this mobile device here, uh, but they will become embedded into our bodies. So we have things like like glasses, which is a form of cyborg technology. It extends your vision. So it's, uh, it's already something that helps you to function better. Uh, and and we are, people who have eyeglasses are pretty dependent of them. So when you, when you take that perspective, Let's say, let's say you lose a little bit of your eyesight. Why would you just restore your eyesight? If you could take it to a new level, if you could see like five kilometers away, if you could see into the infrared range. And this is what is happening with our tools and technologies today, with our development as we go forward, is that we have now these VR headsets, and uh, maybe you have some kind of HUD display on your car, so we will be able soon to layer digital information on top of this like physical reality we are experiencing, we are enhancing it, we are augmenting it. And it's happening faster than we think. And it will make us very dependent of them to be productive at the workplace, to be able to learn and function in future society. So first we will ridiculate these types of technologies. You know, I'm not going to walk around with a headset like that. But after a while, you know, you accept it that, hey, you know, actually this is a good thing and it helps me to b function better. That's how we work with mobile phones, for example. The next step is that we will replace your eye with a computer that is much more sophisticated than the biological eye and it will extend your vision in ways unimaginable right now. What I'm talking about I'm here talking is about the exponential, exponential times we're living, time living in. And exponential, and exponential humanity. humanity. So if you so look, look at, look history, at history, the population, the population growth, growth just exploded, just exploded when we got, when into, we got into, into the industrial, industrial era. era. So there was a long, so long period of time, period of time pretty, of linear, pretty steady linear growth. Steady growth. <laughs> it seemed linear. It seemed linear. Then, then, through our advancement in science and science technology, and technology suddenly, suddenly the population, the population numbers, exploded. numbers exploded. And we've been able to double human lifespan from 45-year-old to 85-year-old on average. Do you know where the retirement age, 65 years old, for example in Finland, where it comes from? In good old times in Germany, Otto von Bismarck in Prussian Germany, um, in those times people who went to war, they died on average like 45 year old. And when Otto von Bismarck had his birthday at 45, he said that if someone lives longer than me, he's going to get the rest of his life as, um, as a gift. 
And with that logic, if our average lifespan is now 85, if you guys live more than 85 year old, then you should you know, get those years for free. So the retirement age, according to that logic, should be 85. We are very much on our way to live 120 years old. It's kind of the gap with our advancements in medicine and science. It's very unlikely you will die of an infection or a, uh, something like this. You're more likely to die of a traumatic injury, like in a car crash. So being in a car is probably the most dangerous thing you can do in today's society, at least for someone my age. So people live all, uh, they get older and they have more complex disease. We have more complex technology also to deal with that. We die of things like cancer and cardiovascular disease and diabetes, but that was not the case in Otto von Bismarck's Germany. If you look at the industrial production, we've been able to, in UK, for example, in the brink of the industrial revolution, we were able to double industrial production in 100 years. Now, China did that in 10 years, and now they're probably doubling it like every freaking month. Has anyone here been to Shenzhen in China? A few people. So Shenzhen is uh, one of the fastest growing cities in China. It's also one of the fastest growing employers. It's close to Hong Kong and Guangzhou. And in Shenzhen, there was like 15, 20 years ago, there was only a, like 200,000 people. Now there's 16 million. And the thing that you notice when you go there immediately is that although it's a big city, it's super silent. You go on the streets, you go into the center, it's super silent because they run on electricity. They have 100% electric public transportation. And even the motorbikes that you see in Asia everywhere is all electric. And they have to go into this because otherwise, you know, they will pollute their own country. So they have no other choice. And, you know, Tencent and Alibaba have headquarters there, some of the biggest internet companies in the world. So th there's discussion like, can like this kind of exponential growth be infinite uh, economic growth? I don't think it will be in current terms, but if it modify the parameters, it can be infinite. It might not be infinite in terms of creating value for the shareholders, but it might be infinite in terms of uh, taking some other parameters that you optimize for, like the environment or human happiness, etc. So there is a lot that we can optimize on this planet still when it comes to the way how we do things. And technology has been key to this. In the brink of the uh, industrial revolution, we moved from water wheels to steam engines and steamboats, and very quickly to electric, electrical engineering and um, and combustion engines and cars and automobiles. Now we are living the paradigm of ICT. Often progress is not really uh, exponentially infinite like that. You know, it's usually that you're jumping from one paradigm to another. I think ICT is coming to its end soon. There is something else coming. There is a post-ICT world. Is it quantum computing? Is it you know, some kind of biological computing? Is something entirely different? It remains to be seen, but I believe that in my lifetime I will see the end of ICT. If you look at the different industrial revolutions, you start from steam engines, basically the first ways to move work that was done by mu human muscle to work that is done by machines. Uh, then perfection of that with mass production, assembly lines, automation, moving into microchips, computing, robots, you know, doing things, automating things on the assembly line, to the fourth industrial revolution that we are living right now, which is technological convergence, where artificial intelligence, big data, robotics is coming together. It's technology at its best. It's converging different avenues of growth, like th think of a self-driving car, battery technology, computing, connectivity, AI, all of those are coming together. 
But there's a next phase coming after that, and that is the biological and technological convergence, where our biological intelligence is converging with our technological intelligence. That's where we're talking about synthetic biology. That's where we are talking about mixed reality interfaces, genetic engineering, and bioartificial intelligence. Looking at the Internet of Things, we are getting to 50 to 100 billion different devices that have intelligence in them. Now, if you think of something that is conscious or intelligent or, or something like this, what, what is your definition to it? Is it that it's able to relate and make choices in, in relation and in context of its environment? If that's intelligence, then our devices are becoming intelligent. They're able to sense their surroundings. They're able to adapt and react uh, to their environment uh, to be a better able to, to um, intelligently maneuver uh, around its immediate surroundings. Now, looking at exponential technologies, we are moving to an exponential trajectory. Uh, and our technological capability is doubling every decade. Our technological paradigm shifts are doubling every decade. It means that in the next 10 years, you will experience more technological paradigm shifts than in the last 100 years. And that is leading us to something what Ray Kurzweil calls technological singularity. So the time to the next major event is smaller and smaller and smaller. So now we have things like we had recently industrial revolution, then we had computers and personal computers and telephony. There is more stuff coming, guys. Even the cost of sequencing the human genome has dropped in 10 years from 10 million to less, now less than $1,000 you can sequence the human genome. I've done that, but it was almost impossible uh, 10 years ago. Looking at the exponential reduction of cost, uh, the cost of DNA sequencing has come down, but so has solar power, which is uh, disrupting uh, energy market. Looking at sensors, in Google's self-driving car, the cost of the sensor, the LiDAR sensor that senses the environment, was half of the price of the car in 2008. Now it is like a couple of thousand uh, US dollars. The mobile phone in your pocket has cumulatively one million of worth of technological capability that existed like 20 years ago. So all of us are walking around with one million of production capability in our pockets and it's just uh, getting infinitely more uh, powerful. 3D printing has come down, the cost of drones has come down. So things that used to be super expensive are now super cheap, almost free. Buckminster Fuller, who was an American architect and system theorist, he called this ephemeralization or dematerialization. How things in our material world are becoming almost dematerial, almost free. And we see that already how we plan, you know, cities or buildings or airplanes, we use 3D models. We don't need physical models anymore and it's democratizing innovation. Talking about democratization and innovation, looking at things like gene editing, it used to be super complex, super difficult, very error prone. Now you can get for 159 US dollars, you can buy uh, a bacterial gene engineering CRISPR kit that enables you to do gene manipulation in your lab with like 90% accuracy. So things that were only accessible to very few is now accessible to everyone, if you want. So this Digitalization leads to digital disruption, leads to demonetization, where things that used to be expensive is cheaper and cheaper, leads to dematerialization, things that were in physical are more digital, more uh, immaterial, leads to democratization of innovation, where more and more people are able to access powerful technologies. Astrophysicist Professor Larry Smarr has been on several uh, NASA missions, and he has a hobby. He's collecting a lot of data about himself. He does this every day. He's been doing that for many years. So he's a, a mathematician and, uh, and he's very interested in data. So he's been gathering you know, big data of his own body. And he noticed uh, that for a long time, his, one of his markers has been off and it's the uh, 
C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. This is supposed to be less than one, and his, his, his numbers have been elevated for a long time. And um, he's been also tracking his gut microbiome. It's a bacterial environment in his gut. You notice that with his symptoms of gut issues, also his bacterial balance start to shift from the blue uh, dots over there to the red area. And they did some colonoscopies and so on, and, and uh, uh, they've been searching, like, what's the problem? Another thing that he noticed that with the shift of his microbial environment, also his body weight started climbing. So looking at his uh, glucose uh, control, his fasting blood glucose started going up with the change in his gut bi microbiome. So if you are getting weight gain and you can't lose it, and you're still you know, eating the same or less calories, doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong about you. There might be something wrong about your gut bacteria, how it processes the food that you have or something entirely different is going on. So Larry has also a, a full body MRI. So what did he do? He uploaded this into a computer to create a simulation. So he can fly in his body, and he noticed something in there. Something he calls the smoking gun. It's a part of the colon, a sigma colon, um, that is abnormal. And he's later discovered that there's genetic reasons why, why, why that is. Uh, genetically, he's more likely to get uh, unexplainable, irritable bowel disease kind of symptoms. So this part of, um, of the colon is not letting stuff through very effectively, and there's not a lot of air coming through. The walls are thicker. So what he did, he contacted Sonia Ramanmorthy, who's a medical doctor and surgeon, and when he came to her office, uh, uh, Sonia tells the story that Larry was the first patient who came with a PowerPoint presentation. And not just a PowerPoint presentation, but a 3D freaking environment to navigate his body, to show what the problem is. And Larry said to Sonia, here's Sonia looking at his colon in his basement, that, um, yeah, probably should like operate this problematic part. So they went into a virtual experience together and they discussed like how to do this. And Larry had been studying for a long time. She was like, he was like, yeah, Sonia, you're a great surgeon and so on, but I would cut here. And, uh, but actually I don't want you to cut, I want the robot to do it because humans make errors. So they contacted into the surgical and got this Da Vinci robot where the surgeon is sitting on a device and operating the patient remotely. You could have the patient in another country. You could do remote surgery. And it's not long when you don't need the doctor anymore. It's going to be done entirely by artificial intelligence. Now, they did this operation, and they had full idea, kind of full understanding of what was going on. All the people in the operation room understood the data from you know, a long time before this operation happened. In real time, they were able to see what was going on. And they even created a 3D virtual experience of this surgery. And uh, they removed the problematic smoking gun. And Larry's gut microbiome after the surgery changed um, more towards where it used to be before the symptoms started. And uh, after the surgery, inflammation went up. But the C-reactive protein, the inflammatory biomarker, it went down to undetectable levels. So he was basically cured of that problem. Now, this story is just an example of what, the future, what is possible in the future. You will have full data all the time of what's going on in your body and will be able to prevent serious health conditions with preventive healthcare, we are able to predict that, hey, this thing might become a problem in the future. We are able to nail down specifically what's going on. So, and it's not just us, but it's machines doing this work. Because humans make errors, doctors make errors, they can't read all the data. Uh, already in x-ray images and 
uh, retinal images, computers can detect certain ailments, certain conditions more accurately than human experts. So when we take all this data, we're able to move from snapshots in healthcare to real-time information of your health and where it's going. Um, in China, they already have um, they already have an artificial intelligence assisted hospital, which is entirely run by AI. And uh, the thing is that they are able to get better treatment outcomes, uh, statistically better results by deploying computers than using real human experts. Peter Drucker, who is a management theorist, has said that what gets measured gets managed. And I've been coming to Estonia for my lab tests like for quite some time now, taking full blood biomarker tests like every half a year. And here are some results that I've been able to do with that data combined with lifestyle interventions and biohacking. So looking at my triglyceride to HDL ratio, my risk for cardiovascular disease, I've been able to drag myself away from potential cardiovascular risk. Now looking at my average blood sugar uh, values, long-term blood sugar control, hemoglobin A1C, I was pre-diabetic. Now I've dragged myself out of any risk for diabetes. Now genetically I also have risk for kidney disease, but I've been able to improve my kidney function filtration rate, my, um, uh, my creatinine levels, and so on, uh, over a very systematic manner in the last six years. Looking at my testosterone levels, when I started, my testosterone levels at 25 looked like I'm over 40-year-old man. Now my testosterone level at 36 looked like I'm less than 25-year-old man. So I've been able to reverse the risk of becoming an old man. If you're interested in any of this stuff, you know, I'm giving a little workshop in the afternoon and I'm going to guide you through like how you can through lifestyle intervention while you kick, you know, do all your work, uh, work really hard and don't sleep enough and, you know, just do a bunch of things, uh, how you can prevent premature death. So there's a lot of data, but it's really hard to understand. Even the numbers that the doctors see, the papers, and the patients get, it's kind of mystical almost. Uh, I've been working on a service that demystifies these values and combines not just strong biomarkers, but also data from health devices, wearables. For example, this ring here is one of the most advanced sensors in the market right now. So quantified self is self-knowledge through numbers. Now we have a lot of different tools and technologies to gain deeper understanding into the human body and how it functions and how to get it to the next level. I think that bioinformatics will be for health what the microscope was for biology or the telescope was for astronomy. With that data and armed with artificial intelligence, we are now gaining access to a new tool that is as revolutionary as the microscope was or the telescope was. We're able to get understanding on a minute by minute basis on your physiological condition. We can look at your genetics, we can understand epigenetics, how the lifestyle factors are affecting your biological machinery. And we can dive into the biomarkers, we can understand how different environmental factors and lifestyle choices are affecting the totality of what it means to be a healthy human being. Here's the human computer. On the background, you can see all the metabolic pathways in the human body. That's the blueprint of how you function. Genetics is coordinating how many of these pathways are working. Epigenetics can change the way how this computer works. You have a lot of different messengers going in your bloodstream all the time. Neurotransmitters, biological uh, messengers in your bloodstream that are sending information. You're an information system. And that translates to different behaviors for survival. Human augmentation will be the biggest thing next. So technology is not just anymore for automating things, but it's about augmenting 
how we get things done. The human optic nerve is one of the best understood information channels. And right now, it's really clumsy that we use this thing to project information on your retina, and then we use these clumsy fingers, extensions of your nervous system, to operate these things. We can do better, you know, we can go directly to the brain. And this is what Elon Musk is doing now with his new company, Neuralink. The, that's kind of like, I think technology is becoming the real third eye. It's becoming really a part of us, almost a telepathic medium through which we can, uh, you know, get things done without moving a finger. The transition from automation, which was all about the Industrial Revolution, to augmentation, where technology is observing what you do and is making intelligent choices based on what it sees, will be the most significant event since the Industrial Revolution. I think that the human biological environment is becoming and turning into the next computing platform. And we will use technology that goes into our bodies, is working in symbiotic relationship directly with our biology. We're extending our capabilities. We can already 3D print organs. You know, we can augment our senses with technology. <clears throat> we can bring new senses through our nervous system into our bodies. Telepathic communication with computers is already possible. I can just read your brain activity and translate that to commands to the computer. And you train a little bit and you can start moving things with your mind. That's where we're heading. We are turning into the next platform. That's the next big thing. We are moving from evolution that happened by natural selection to evolution that is now happening with intelligent design where humans are using their scientific results, technological capability to take evolution to their own hands. It's already happening. If you're interested in any of this stuff, if you want to learn personally, like how you can you know, optimize your biology, this weekend we have the Biker Summit here in Tallinn at Baba Lava. Uh, the topic is decoding optimal health. And with the code tech day, you can get 50% off. We have tomorrow, we have an upgrade dinner that I'm guiding with food and nutrition, like how to optimize that side. And on Saturday, we have the full conference day. And you know, you're all almost welcome. It's the first in Tallinn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Temu. Of course, it was a bit difficult material and uh, content for me as a journalist, but I'm not sure uh, for, for our audience, I think not. Kas kellegi on küsimusi? Ekraan oli tühi. Saate praegu kohe võtta mikrofoni kätte ja kõva selge älega ja siis ka soovitavalt Temu kodukeeles. Uh, Andri, I have a question of uh, how much of this tracking and managing your health is like solo? Uh, do you have like team demo and weekly meetings, like permanent mm. group of uh, advisors or how, how is it? Yeah, I mean, every company is run, you know, you have a board of directors and you have key performance indicators and reviewing, you know, quarterly and weekly reports. Uh, I also have that. But at the moment, actually, computers are doing most of that work. So what I like about sensors and technologies is when they are almost ambient, they're kind of embedded in your daily activity so that you don't have to think much about it. This ring I charge once a week. I don't have to think more about it. It's, it has no user interface. I'm not touching anything here. So I just, you know, keep it on my body and then I get the results on my phone. And, and you know, I review every day. I just look at the data and how I'm doing. This is telling me time for more sleep. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that advice tonight. So. Uh, I'm using most of my time on interpretation, least of my time in tracking. So with things like, like this, that is tracking my posture and vibrating, you know, when I get slouchy or something like this, it's doing the work for me and it's kind of reminding me when it needs to. So I'm not like constantly like tracking and looking at numbers and all that. 
I don't think it makes any sense because the numbers are not the truth. The map is not the territory. The territory comes only through like deeper inquiry going into, you know, into the territory and then seeing how things work. The map really helps to navigate, obviously. So, um, but, but I'm happy to hand over the control to artificial intelligence. I think um, we need to do that because they are m more capable of dealing with complex matters than humans are. Officially, time's over. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. See you That's at 13.15 on the workshop. Thank you. Temo Arena.